Okay, thanks, um, Charlotte, uh, for for the intro. I'm really excited to to kind of uh, talk about data and testing, um, and kind of bringing in software engineering principles into data engineering. Um, and I'll be kind of doing so in terms with the lens of having um, basically three different uh, environments in kind of the data engineering world and what that means for infrastructure. Um, but before I kind of do that. Um, I will kind of give a quick intro about my, myself. Um, so I am based in Philadelphia, but uh, have been to DC many times. So, um, you know, not, not too far away. I lead data engineering at Perpe, which is a FinTech and e-commerce um, uh, uh, platform. Uh, offices again headquartered in in Philly and there um, really my responsibilities um, go everything from uh, interacting with uh, software engineers to understand what features are being built, um, understanding the data coming out of it, and then making sure that we can track those features um, and kind of everything that the, the data platform that allows us to, to, to do that. So the infrastructure of our uh, data warehouse, all of our kind of ETLs, reverse ETLs, um, and then the kind of the analytics engineering aspect. So um, the transformations, business context, trying to kind of wrap my head around that. So work very closely with software engineers, data scientists, analysts, kind of um, everything under, under that umbrella. So uh, I am also an avid uh, blogger and just kind of generally involved with startups in the data space. So happy to kind of talk about that um, at the end or with with anyone um, on I'll share with kind of my contact at the end. So as far as kind of what um, I'll be uh, talking through today, um, so I'll start with like what it even means to support three envir environments in data engineering and really why wasn't one isn't enough. I think this is something that is fairly understood in the software engineering world, but has some some quirks when it comes to uh, data and analytics. And that will bring us to testing data and how that differs from testing uh, in software engineering. And lastly, I'll kind of dive into a tool that I am really excited about, uh, Terraform, what it is, how it enables uh, reliable, scalable, and kind of tested platforms in honestly just both software engineering and uh, data. And I'll kind of go through the presentation, but Feel free to uh, post questions in the in the chat, or we'll you know happy to answer any questions at the end. I think there will be uh, kind of plenty of time for that. And the the last caveat before I kind of dive in, I did give uh, this presentation at the Pi Data Global Conference. So if you happen to attend that, this will be um, very similar. I'll kind of just expand on some of the topics in a little bit more detail, um, as I don't have to uh, squeeze it into to just twenty minutes. Alrighty, so. Uh, many of you are likely familiar with kind of continuous integration. So tools like GitHub or GitLab, um, Bitbucket is another one, enable collaboration. And different branches on these tools correspond to different levels of development testing and accuracy. So diving into that uh, a little bit more. So when we have a code base, right, we have the master branch, which is the most tested, most reliable, most accurate branch. This is kind of your source of truth and this is what's in production so production i mean in the software engineering world i'm going to kind of continue to draw these these parallels um throughout kind of the presentation but in the software engineering world right you have an application that means that like and your end users are able to access the application um and and and, and use it and do stuff whether it's uh buy items if you're in e-commerce or whatever it may be um really uh, this just has downstream dependencies and that is the same in, in data as well. So staging, this is the kind of candidate for production. Uh, last testing before release, your release candidate, you have some new features you've worked on and you're just kind of bringing it, bringing it all together. And this is what you're, you likely want to put into production whether with whatever release process that you might have. Um, then lastly, there are kind of the feature branches. So <clears throat> these are right developers, data engineers, really anyone interacting with um, the CI tool like GitHub uh, that can make changes and submit them for review. So this might be right in the software engineering world, like really just any change, whether it be a change to copy or change any change to code. In the data world, similarly, any change to code, this could be any SQL query, um, report, transformation, ETL, like anything that you want to version, basically. So <clears throat> uh, 
So in data engineering, the separation between these branches gets trickier because the environment isn't just code. And that to me, I think is the biggest difference um, that really there's data involved and testing data is really, really important. So let's kind of walk through these environments again, but with the data lens. So in production, you are maybe connected to a data warehouse. Um, you bring in third party data as kind of raw uh, data and you run SQL transformations uh, on this raw data and write it back to kind of new your new uh, data marts or schemas <clears throat> that are your source of truth. This could be Right, let's say you're um, in e commerce, like any you know, popular e commerce uh, site will have um, an idea of, of orders, what status they're in, whether they're shipped, like all of that information that is likely dispersed across different vendors. And you have to bring in the information from different vendors or different tracking for if it's shipped on UPS or FedEx, whatever. Um, that like data can get, <laughs> as um, I'm sure most of us know, like, can get very, very complicated very quickly. So, um, what is kind of unique about production? Um, so earlier I mentioned downstream dependencies and in software, again, this is like, especially if you're B2C, consumers are involved. In uh, most analytics teams are structured in such a way that a lot of the analytics are internal analytics. I think the analytics space in, in general is just coming around um, to publishing uh, analytics to consumers. I mean, I think the best example is um, uh, like rideshare apps, you know, like Uber or, you know, uh, apps like DoorDash, where you have, um, uh, I, I believe like for Uber, there for a driver, there are analytics around like how many trips they've done and what the average time is, um, so on and so forth. And they might want to provide some analytics there. So those are the, the end um, users of the app. But I would say in, in many companies, most of the analytics are internal. So really your users aren't consumers, Per se, they're your stakeholders, so they're your peers, um, product managers, marketing leads. Um, they they view the dashboards and rely on them to to make decisions. So, for example, again, I'll just kind of rely on the the e-commerce um, uh, example that I mentioned earlier throughout, just to just to be consistent. Um, but like in e-commerce, you might have someone in merchandising who's trying to understand where is demand coming from, what are people asking for that we uh, you know we might not have on the website. Um, how's margin doing stuff like that. So the, now going on to, you know, moving away from the production branch and kind of talking about staging, the purpose of a staging branch and, um, a staging environment is to test code to, uh, ensure it's ready for production. So in analytics, um, it's testing code and data. It's not just testing code to ensure outputs are comparable, the most thorough way to do that is to read production data so that changes are only changes in code and not changes in environment. You really want to compare apples to, to apples. And I'll kind of dive into that a little bit more. So imagine if you have um, a, a, a production environment and you expect certain volumes of information and you ex expect certain types of information, you have a staging environment where maybe you have much lower volumes and and you haven't had users uh, take uh, maybe an expected action. And so, for example, let's say in a staging environment, no one has paid you, right? No one has checked out. Um, and maybe, uh, yes, sure, you can mock that information, but that's just fundamentally different than production. And so um, understanding when you write queries and transformations and how that data will behave um, in a dashboard and, and on the analytics side, um, in my opinion, the best way to do that is to read from production data. You just really don't want to write um, to, to production because obviously that will impact, you know, people actually seeing the thing that you're testing, which is why staging and production should be separate. So you want to compare apples to apples. And without that, it could be easy to kind of miss a change that's a bug in code that you accidentally assume only exists in a non-production environment. Now, to make the stakes even higher, it's not just uh, dashboards. There are so many tools that kind of go into um, each uh, branch and all that data could be sent to, to third parties via reverse ETL tools. So, um, right, how do you ensure data is formatted in a way that complies with your reverse ETL integrations? Um, how do you make sure that you're not uh, changing the data for more you know, users are more rows sending to these reverse ETL integrations um, than, than you intend. And 
here testing this is the kind of the most important piece is like before you actually send it to um, kind of a third party tool because it has the highest impact on stakeholders and this is the place i think where the uh the data and the output of uh the analytics team uh can actually be exposed to consumers so for example same e-commerce platform let's say you email people after they check out um, or you email them when they added something to cart to, to their cart but like haven't checked out right to maybe incentivize them um, with that uh one uh, potential architecture for that could be um, setting up, right, there are tools in the kind of reverse CTL space, Census, High Touch are just two that I mentioned here, Airbyte's another, there, there are a few more that are emerging as well. Um, setting up this tool to maybe send to a third party marketing tool, like say HubSpot or, um, uh, you know, MailChimp or something like that. Um, send data to that third party tool, which will then trigger emails automatically. Um, and so there again, like because the, the data coming from your warehouse ultimately gets into a marketing tool and gets in front of consumers, this is very, very um, high stakes. This is truly uh, production you are getting in front of consumers. In the kind of, in the software engineering world, um, if you imagine right in Python, there are fairly uh, common uh, architectures to be used for testing, specifically for unit testing, like I mean, there's a unit test uh, library, there's a PyTest library, it's it's fairly agreed upon um, in terms of, right, if you're a software engineer, you write mocks and you write tests and you have a testing framework and it's um, uh, written about, a lot of people talk about it, a lot of people do it the same way, to be honest, um, but in the data world, you can, um, I think unit testing is very important in terms of mocking um, certain situations, testing code, testing to make sure that like your, your logic is sound. However, I just fundamentally don't believe that this is enough um, because you could unit test code thinking you accounted for all of the edge cases, but the data is telling you otherwise. Um, additionally, data continuously updates. So you want to ensure nothing changed upstream that would flow through as bugs downstream. So for example, um, right, you intake data from a lot of different, um, you intake data from a lot of different uh, sources. And let's say there's in a source, there are like two different types of data that you expect. And all of a sudden, there's the third type of data. And this is just not something that, that, that you expect. And so you want to be able to, um, if you, you know, you can't, if let's say you get this, this third, you can't test for four or five or six, you have no idea how many different types of data, what format it could take, that's kind of out of your hands um, as a member of the analytics team and as someone who's implementing this. And so um, testing to make sure that uh, your data is what, what you expect um, is incredibly important to catch these types of differences when it's out of your control and you don't really know when it's happening. So this is where um, pipeline tests come in. And I think the, um, the, uh, the Abe uh, Gong, the CEO of Great Expectations, which is a tool I'll kind of talk about in a second, he, I think, really coined um, this, this term of pipeline test because uh, what it, if you think of a data pipeline, there are several steps. The first is so you have those, so you have the raw data, you run transformations, you run maybe some more transformations, maybe this, there are some more dependent transformations on top of that. Um, and then that clean data feeds into uh, dashboards. And I think the difference between just like testing and alerting passively is a pipeline test. If you integrate it inside your workflow, then you have this kind of, um, if it passes, everything is great. But if it fails, um, if, if a particular test fails, so let's say you only expect two different data types um, in one particular raw data set, but now you have three. If it fails, it won't actually update any dashboard data because maybe your dashboard isn't built to accommodate for uh, multiple different types of data. In right in this very uh, specific uh, case, ideally it would. Um, but the 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 point is that stale data in this case, um, I think, is better than bad data because you know the stale data is fundamentally correct; it's just out of date. However, 
Um, if you uh, you know have new data that isn't accounting uh, accounted for, it's it's on, in certain situations it could be displayed kind of in a dashboard where it is fundamentally incorrect because maybe there's some sort of case statement or like look ML in Looker written to group data in different ways without the expectation that there's this other um, uh, type or other piece of information, and so that could just fundamentally uh, uh, break down. So. There are kind of um, a lot of different tools uh, in this space. So really what the tools are just like off, they're, they're offering frameworks for pipeline tests. If, I mean, PyTest is a framework um, so that you don't have to like code this framework from scratch. It's very much a plug and play. And what really as an analytics uh, professional, what, when using these tools, what you would really inject is your business context, right? So you expect data type one and two and not three. That's only, that's that's something that um, you would know, well, maybe that's something that might be automatically detected, but maybe you expect a um, the, the average number of orders per day to be roughly X amount, um, or you want to be alerted if some sort of edge case happens because it happened um, before and it has a really high business impact. So, um, all of this goes to just say that there's right great expectations. Um, uh, Soda, Datafold, Big Eye, there are a few others out there, right? Light Up Data, Monte Carlo. Um, there, there's a lot being built in this space because I think um, it's it's fairly uh, agreed upon among practitioners, um, you know, founders, investors that there's kind of a lot of uh, there's a lot of risk to um, to, to bad data, um, especially now that we're operationalizing it more um, and sending it to third-party tools. There's a lot more risk to bad data. And so, um, right, if you accidentally flip your uh, 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 your uh, flag for like an item, if it's in stock or out of stock to some sort of advertising that you're doing on Facebook, and now all of a sudden your, your, uh, uh, your ads and your, you're paying for displaying pictures of items and information about items that are actually out of stock instead of in stock, right? That has like huge top line impact for metrics like revenue, right? Your revenue would probably take a dip because people are going to be clicking on those products and realizing that they can't actually purchase them because they're out of stock. So making sure that those types of little mishaps just for moving quickly as, as um, kind of many people and startups do and have to do, making sure that those kind of uh, don't, don't happen. So what does this mean in terms of environments, right? So we talked about like testing and all of that, but like how do these two, two concepts kind of mix? So what it really comes down to is I think an entirely separate staging data source. The I'll kind of talk about caveats um, uh, in, in a little bit about this, but really it's separating as much as possible and as much as you're willing to honestly pay for um, your uh, either uh, production and staging schemas or um, databases or warehouses altogether. Um, but uh, the point is that the data is separated with uh, production third-party data uh, writing to both the production um, data source or data set, uh, data warehouse, database, wherever you store it, but writing to your kind of, let's say your two different warehouses, you have raw data writing to both production and your uh, staging uh, data warehouse. And what this does is that then when you run <clears throat> different tests on production and staging, you're comparing apples to apples. So in theory, if the staging development branch uh, matches uh, master because it was just merged in, then in theory, all of your tests should pass just the same because all the data is just the same and the code is just the same. Um, but if you then make a change to the code, you, you right, it's, it's, it's like a science experiment. Everything besides your transformation code is constant. So you test only one thing at a time. So if your data is constant, you change the code, that's the thing that you're testing. Now, speaking to uh, feature branches, similarly, each person could uh, read from the production warehouse and have their own development schema to, to play around in. So this could be really just their place to play around with data, kind of uh, dig into it, do some experimentation, um, do some kind of uh, exploration. Um, this is, I mean, particularly relevant in the more the, the analyst or data science role, but um, really helpful for any sort of just like ad hoc analyses. And um, so really right here, the, the principles are with, with developing new code and like science experiments. I really think that's like, that's the kind of the analogy that I'll go with of, Keep, just keeping things separate and testing one thing at a time. But 
in both software, software and data and data engineering, infrastructure matters. It's um, so just now, right? My my example was having two different warehouses, even two different databases, right? That's 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 infrastructure. It's all the security around it, right? If you're writing raw data to both production and a staging, let's say you're in the um, financial sector or something, right? You that that data might be much more regulated. And you have to be very careful about not only who has access to it, how you're storing it, how you're encrypting it, um, so on and so forth. And so. Um, the, the infrastructure, it, it, especially when it, when you get to, right, having transformations and then reverse CTL and all of these different tools are just so many moving parts. And so it can get really complicated. Um, and the other thing with infrastructure is, you know, what if you need to make a change, um, deploying a new machine learning model. And let's say you want to make sure that your infrastructure can take the additional training load, right? Training a machine learning model. Um, can be quite memory intensive, CPU intensive. Let's say you're running it on your um, uh, directly on the same infrastructure as your orchestrator to like run just scheduled SQL queries that don't take um, very much memory at all. Um, you want to be able to make sure, you know, test that without um, accidentally influencing any sort of production workflows. The, the last thing that you want to do is impact production. Um, and so testing this new code involves changing. Um, which then means like testing infrastructure. So testing and staging, um, you're uh, ensuring that infrastructure is just functionally separate from production, just like your data is functionally separate. So um, production can go on no matter what's being tested. And the the last, um, the second idea that I'd really like to hone in on here is, again, they're as similar as can be. So, so just like you want the data to be as similar in staging and production, you want the infrastructure to be as, as similar as can be but between the two environments so that you can under, understand the exact scale of infrastructure your new machine learning model, for example, um, or just any other new process needs, and at a, at a minimum, um, be able to estimate it accurately. So data platforms have kind of grown in complexity and um, gotten very, you know, sophisticated with the, with the modern data stack um, and tools like Fivetran um, in the ETL space, right? Uh, warehouses like Snowflake, you have BI tools like Looker, um, reverse ETL tools, right? I mentioned like uh, there's workflow orchestrators which just like schedule your stuff to run, be it Airflow or Dagster. Um, that's only what, like five pieces of the um, uh, of the, the, the data stack that I mentioned, that's not even, um, touching anything. You know, I, I don't even know if I mentioned data quality, even though I talked about it earlier in the presentation, but the point is, um, there's kind of a lot going on here and complexity means more moving parts and more tools. So if you're, if it's complex enough to build the production environment end to end, Imagine how complex it is to not only build a production environment, but also build a staging environment and then make sure that there's parity between the changes that you make between the two environments. That's a lot of infrastructure, right? You're basically doubling everything. And functionally separate means duplicated. That's like by design. And that's the point I'm trying to hammer on. Um, there is, of course, a cost. Um, if you duplicate infrastructure, right, if you duplicate your data, even if it is in the same warehouse, you're definitely going to increase your warehouse costs. Um, so if, if you separate it even more, yes, you could close to double the cost of your infrastructure. But um, one thing I would like to point out is comparing the cost of duplicate infrastructure or the cost of making a wrong decision that fundamentally harms your business. Um, if copying these manually, there's kind of room for error. Um, and Error, again, also means potential harm to your business. I think of it almost like insurance, right? You buy health insurance, uh, maybe one year it'll pay off because you knock on wood, hopefully no one does, but you you know, you know need it or you get an accident, whatever. But the other years you, you pay for it just in case because you have, um, th there's, a there's a risk that, you know, without it, it could really harm um, your uh, life for a very long time. So testing and staging, um, making changes to your data sets, but forgetting to right, uh, uh, make those changes in, in production when you merge your staging branch into master is this is a manual process. And I think that every manual process is bound to fail because we are humans, we're, we forget, we're naturally fallible. So I'm all about kind of automating this and making it as repeatable as possible. Uh, 
a few weeks ago, maybe even a couple months ago, um, uh, Tristan Handy kind of uh, talked about um, uh, infrastructure as code and, and kind of how that fits into the modern uh, data stack and modern data experience. And so infrastructure as code, this is something that I really fundamentally believe in as well. Um, it's, uh, it, it's exactly what it sounds like. Um, define your infrastructure in code that can be versioned and stored in a CI CD tool like GitHub, like GitHub or GitLab or Bitbucket with all of your other code. Um, what this does is it really allows for a few things. Um, first and foremost, repeatability. You can copy your code and deploy it in staging and production just as easily. Now, um, uh, one thing that uh, Tristan, um, so Tristan Handy uh, is the one who gave the talk. He's the CEO of DBT Labs, um, which is kind of a, a really uh, great uh, transfer open source um, transformation tool that also has a cloud hosted option as well. Um, so if you haven't heard of it, definitely um, encourage you to check out DBT. But what I'd uh, really like to harp on is he mentioned something that that's really important, um, specific to infrastructure, which is treating your in infrastructure as cattle and not as pets. Um, this is kind of a, a, a harsh um, analogy, but it's very popular in the DevOps world. And the point is that um, if you treat it as a pet, you're very attached to it. And if something goes wrong, you spend so much time trying to write, if we're talking about infrastructure, something goes wrong with some instance that you're running somewhere and you try so hard to, to fix it when really if it's coded, you just bring it down, bring it back up and you know it's gonna be exactly the same. Hopefully that works. Um, and so the point is that you can make infrastructure repeatable, you can destroy it. You don't clog your production environment with code or infrastructure that belongs in feature branches that you don't really, that isn't really production. You don't want to take the burden of uh, maintaining like production. So that could be your reverse ETL test mappings. It could be dashboards. It could be random views you created in your dashboarding tool, um, you, you name it. So how do you actually use uh, Terraform? So there are uh, a few, uh, I would say Terraform is um, kind of one of the most popular infrastructure, infrastructure as code tools, but there are several others out there, um, namely Plumi, which um, uh, conceptually does the same thing, but just implemented a little bit differently. But a lot of software tools and cloud tools, right? AWS, GCP, Azure are, um, are, are supported. And what you can do is here, what you see is a, a declaration file of in uh, Terraform. Um, of uh, different pieces of infrastructure. So uh, data databases, um, right, virtual machines, security groups, different um, uh, permissions that everyone always struggles with. Um, and how it's used is you run terminal, you run a terminal command to launch all of this infrastructure and just as easily, right, code a change, right, change it in your uh, code. And to deploy the change, you just run the same um, terminal com command. Like similarly in the terminal, you can um, right, you can uh, apply and create infrastructure. You can modify, you can destroy infrastructure. So what does this mean for data? Imagine if your entire data platform could be coded, right? So you could launch DBT um, in the cloud as well as your Snowflake database. You can code all of your ETL mappings in five strands. So you can write this data to both staging and production without manually redoing them between environments and risk right, like missing one particular report or something like that and finding out later. Um, take a step further, <clears throat> take uh, Looker, right, BI tool, maybe even, right, Power BI, Tableau, um, your LookML, all your, your dashboards, and you translate all of that into code so that there's parity between what you have in the tool and what you have in code. And not shown here are kind of third-party tools like reverse CTL tools to basically send data from your warehouse to um, third-party tools, like I mentioned, like marketing tools or something like that. Um, one of the reverse CTL tools actually, um, Airbyte has already kind of written about uh, deploying ETL. Well, they actually do ETL and reverse CTL, um, but they have kind of written a lot about um, how to de deploy their tool in Terraform. So why should we care? Where does that get us? A data platform that is uh, repeatable and testable is is where it gets us. Um, testable, right? We can in, we can implement pipeline tests and um, know that there's parity between staging and production. That we're really testing the code and the actual change that in question. Um, second, uh, right? It 
it being uh, the data platform being repeatable uh, means that right deleting dashboards doesn't mean they're gone forever. They just make your data platform clean, tidy, fully tested. And if they're in code in a feature branch somewhere, that doesn't cost anyone anything. It's in a feature branch. If you need to apply it, it's always there, and you can always reference it. And lastly, um, you can easily support um, multiple environments to ensure scale and quality of your data products. So with that, I want to kind of leave you with, with a few things. So first, I'm a kind of huge proponent of comparing apples to apples. So just like you limit experiments to one variable, um, limit testing to just the code and, and not the environment uh, differences, right? Take as many variables out of the equation as possible. Uh, second, test on full testing on full data sets ensures that you don't miss edge cases, right? You don't have to think about when writing these pipeline tests, what to expect. You don't have to write interview like stakeholders and understand business context. You write the test. If it fails, then that's that's your production data, right? Also in a staging platform, if the test fails, there are no downstream dependencies. So all you do is you 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 change it, you you figure it out, you try it again, and then it passes, and then right, no harm, no foul. And and uh, lastly, right, setting up your environments as code, this makes them uh, repeatable, uh, then there's parity between staging and, and production. And so, um, again, all of this is just to enable kind of uh, better testing and building trust in your data organization. Uh, quality data tested data means that more people can rely on it with, with confidence and make decisions with confidence, knowing they're not making decisions on bad data. And I'd, I'd like to just end with a shout out to my coworker, Derek, who um, has really pioneered Ter Terraform at, at Perpe. And, and I'm really um, helping just, you know, bring that into the, um, the data org. So I am on um, LinkedIn, Twitter, um, Medium. So feel free to, especially Twitter, my, my DMs are open. Um, you know, if anyone has any questions after this talk, but happy, happy to chat there. And um, with that, I'll kind of um, leave it open for questions. So I'll, I'll, if nobody else has um, wants to kick kick off the questioning, um, I would like to hear a little bit more detail on the the types of tests you run and the tools you use to run them to make those decisions about, you know, did this code change work, right? So if you're making changes to um, maybe not the infrastructure code, but let's say like the analysis code that underlies the Looker dashboard or whatever, maybe, so maybe the, the data is supposed to change because you're, again, you're making an analytical change, right, to, to the script that underlies it, but how, um, how, what are your thoughts on, on testing whether that change worked and what tools do you recommend to do that? Yeah, totally. Um, from my perspective, I think uh, making changes to code and tests in parallel. So like, let's just go, I'll, I'll answer the tooling question second. Um, but, you know, imagine all your tests are ready in code and you're making a change. Um, trying to make a change to the code, make a change to the tests in kind of the same go so that you're under the same headspace and you're not kind of uh, just reacting to a failed test, but you're thinking critically about what is truly supposed to happen. Um, and um, uh, that's kind of my, my approach to testing. And now what to test, I kind of separate tests into two different buckets. Um, the first is kind of the logical and formatting tests of like, if this test fails, something will break. So that means, um, for example, your, you expect certain column names, right? Um, uh, the, right, if in stock, true or false, right, that column in stock can't be renamed to like in stock flag or something, because that would break any references downstream that, that um, that reference it. Um, also, uh, checking um, you know different values of, for example, if you have a percent column, um, uh, making sure that the uh, right are the values in the percent column are they ratios? Are they supposed to be between, between zero and one? Or are they supposed to be between zero and one hundred? Um, stuff like that, in terms of just like lot like logically and structurally, what is supposed to be true. And then the second thing that I kind of think about is like business metrics. So for example, um, uh, you know, one example I kind of uh, mentioned already is uh, talking about like the number of uh, rows in a table, or that could be um, if you have a, a, a row 
per day of number of orders, an average number of orders per day. Um, if it's like zero, um, that means something upstream broke um, or you actually have zero orders and that's like a huge problem because especially if it's supposed to be a really big number and so but that um, is I think where um, the you know the the people on the analytics team need to understand the business and so that's where like business metrics kind of come in um, as for tooling I'm a huge fan of great expectations it's an open source library where you um, can code uh, tests in Python so basically the fundamental concepts are you have a batch, which is kind of your data. And then you have expectations, um, which is like, what do you expect of your data? So I expect the values in this column to be between zero and one. And then you, uh, so you code those expectations and then upon each um, uh, run of the data pipeline, you can run a validation. So you can validate that your new data matches the expectations that you've coded. And so what this does is, you can see what failed, you can document um, your tests, so on and so forth. Um, there are um, also a lot of tools that um, frankly are paid, so I haven't kind of tried it quite as intimately, um, but tools like Big Eye and Datafold that <clears throat> will automatically pick up any metric drift. So for example, um, uh, uh, big guy will use like AI and, and just honestly like statistics to basically understand like what is out of ordinary for a particular um, metric. And so that will kind of happen automatically. And so if you're uh, kind of, if your upstream data changes, it will kind of adjust, but also notify when that changes. Um, and so there's kind of two different approaches in terms of coding very explicitly what you expect or um, having more automated like ongoing statistical kind of inference about like what are the bounds that are within reason. Yeah, do you um do you run these tests every time you run the pipeline and if you do are you actually running the test or the validation based on actual data or cuz I mean, unit tests usually use some type of mock data in my experience. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, uh, I um, have run it on both. Um, so I think that running, um, like I think running tests with mock data is really important to test your code. So for example, with um, data that hasn't changed, but maybe with code that has changed because you do upload a new feature, um, you know, to make sure that your expectations are still, still hold and still are valid. But I do think that it's also very important to um, run uh, expectations on uh, live data. And so this is actually what we do at Perpay. And so how this works is basically an update to data, like a table is stored in a temporary location, um, like in a temporary schema. And so then the validations are run on that new table um, to make sure that anything upstream didn't influence any changes. Um, and once that passed, then it's copied over to its final location and that kind of swap swap happens. Um, and so I do think that's kind of important to understand, um, especially like as you have uh, more and more uh, upstream data that's kind of being written into, into the warehouse that you might um, either not have as much control over, or there's just like a lot of it. And so it's hard to keep up. Um, having the test on live data ensures that you kind of catch any changes. And if you have, so if you're say testing something that has a lot of data and it's, you know, it's gonna be consistent because like at least not in terms of the, like how big the numbers are gonna be, but these are integers, these are strings, et cetera. Um, like we, we have something where we log uh, the counts, like the expected count based on um, one equation and then the actual count that gets inserted, but we have it as a log instead of a test. So is there, so you would just run the test before to make sure those are the same and then you would insert the data or just yeah. trying to do workflow? Yeah, yeah. I think there are two different approaches. I think it depends how critical it is. So, right, if it's, if you just want to know about it, but you think it's correct, then I think, you can log something, but then um, I would recommend um, like alerting on it just to make sure that the log um, 
doesn't at least I know that I <laughs> um I easily like forget about what 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 logs to check and stuff like that um that just might be a, a me problem um but I always like to like send a slack alert or send an email or something like that um if something is different but I do think that um if there is um, a change in uh, code that might be just like fundamentally inaccurate um, or like a bug, then, I mean, it, de it depends whether you'd like to expose raw data or if you'd like the data to go stale. Obviously, um, in an ideal world, uh, the data is uh, accurate and up to date, but I think it's, it's, it's kind of a, a trade-off and I think that is a little bit organization dependent. But I am kind of curious to, to hear about you, the, the log case that you have a little bit more. Um, yeah, so actually we, we were working, we, we, we are migrating over to code as infrastructure, um, because, uh, the team that we inherited a pipeline from, they used talent, which didn't, wasn't capable of using our thing. Uh, we weren't able to check logs. Nobody knew what was going on in the pipeline. There was no documentation left, all the mess. And basically we are now setting up so that you can, access the logs in multiple places that um, it, it becomes a challenge for us. We can't do local de development uh, because we don't, we don't have access to terminals. We don't have access. We can't run things until we actually push them up to the, our develop, we have a dev QA and prod pipeline. Uh, and so it's, it's become a challenge, but at this point we are trying to add as much logging as we can so that if something does break, and then we also have um, the Airflow UI which I'm building out so that every single table that we build is visible. And if that one single one breaks, we will know, we will be able to see it and it will cancel all of the upstream uh, things. So right now, but we, we, haven't, we haven't worked on writing tests yet because doing this migration has been the goal. Um, we've looked at unit tests, but um, this is actually really useful for other ideas. Um, but right now, uh, right now it, it all sits as logging. Um, so the example I was giving was I wrote something to pull data from SharePoint because we have their SharePoint API. And um, there's a way to get the count of the data that just gives you the count that's in the, um, that's in the, in the API, like in, in, on the website. And then you have the, uh, you have another way where you actually pull down all the items and those items get inserted. And once those items are inserted, you're then doing that count. So you can demonstrate at least that 11 rows were added and then 11 rows were in, were like 11 new row, rows existed. So that's kind of the work right now. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that totally makes sense. That's really interesting. Um, I think that like, for example, something that I would think about is, okay, so let's say you expect 11 rows to be um, written. Like what if, what, what if there are 10? Um, and then like, if you do end up writing that, if you do end up just logging and then writing that data downstream, what pulls, like what pulls from your output? And is there some sort of sum over a column that now has a null that you didn't expect to, that you didn't coalesce now some whole number is null. And then that just like propagates downstream. Um, and so I think it's about like, uh, it's, it's about like how much, um, how much do you code, uh, downstream to be able to, um, account for any of that missing data or is missing data unacceptable? And I think that really depends on like on, on the use case, um, and, and, you know, what, how the data is being used and kind of what it means internally to your organization. Got it. That's actually really helpful. Thank you. Um, yeah, but if, if there aren't um, kind of any other questions, I'd, I'd be happy to hear if anyone wants to share like their kind of um, data testing journey or kind of how they think about different um, environments, either in software engineering or, um, you know, data engineering. I mean, personally, I'm here because uh, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to, to build one out and, uh, you know, it's, it's a struggle. I just, um, I just overwrote like an important column name in a schema and like broke somebody's code the other day. And uh, then before that I overwrote like an entire table in the temp schema. So like all sorts of fun stuff is going on right now. It's kind of the wild west. And 
uh, you know, I'm here like looking for some guidelines. Um, and this was really helpful to me in terms of like structuring my thought around how everything should ideally be set up. Uh, you know, hopefully there are others out there who are working in like environments where this is actually being done uh, somewhat correctly. Yeah, I think um, it's it's interesting that you mentioned that. Um, and uh, I recently completed like a pretty big um, migration um, in terms of how we're storing our data. And so there was like so much QA and so much, I mean, think it wouldn't have been possible without a staging environment because I would have just been um, testing in production. That would have been like absolutely no fun, so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, this is one of my takeaways. I'm like, oh, staging environment, like this, this is what needs to happen here. It's great. Cool. Um, if there are no other questions at the moment, um, I think we can like go ahead and, and call it a night. Um, but again, this is going to be, uh, this is going to be put up on the Women Who Code YouTube channel. Um, and I'll let everyone, I'll comment on the meetup link to let everyone know when that recording is posted. And then also, as Sarah mentioned, um, you know, she is available on various other platforms, such as Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, Sarah, I may be, you know, hitting you up again for, for some more, <laughs> for some more testing advice now that I know, like, you're full of great testing advice. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming and talking to us. I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll hopefully, uh, you know, keep in touch. Thanks. Um, it was a pleasure and, you know, happy to answer any questions or honestly just chat. Happy to always hear about um, different use cases. And, and we are kind of expanding what we're doing at Purpa as well. So always happy to, to brainstorm. Thanks, everyone. Um, awesome. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Good night.